I am a magician. I'm a cruciverbalist. You said it correctly. Uh, Crusa meaning cross and verbal meaning word, cross word. Uh, I've basically taken the world's nerdiest hobbies and combined them into one <laughs> career. My parents are thrilled. Um, but I think that magic and puzzles are the same thing because I think that all magic tricks are puzzles. I think they test your ability to figure out what is going on. They challenge your brain to figure out the solution. And the, uh, the most important thing for me is that I, I don't pretend to have superpowers. See, most magicians in some way or another, uh, they pretend to have a, a supernatural ability. But I acknowledge right up front that magic is science and it's, uh, it's based on, on uh, centuries of, 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 of testing human behavior and, uh, and, to great, to, and to great success we design our illusions around that. So I'm gonna talk to you this morning uh, a little bit about uh, a principle of illusion. Um, I, I've been writing a book that will come out in May, so it's, it's way too early to plug that. But this is uh, this is going to be one of the one of the chapters in the book, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but I'm going to start uh, with a local story since I'm here in my my hometown. Uh, I guess I can say that I've been here ten years now uh, in Los Angeles hometown, um, and it involves Hollywood director Edgar Wright, who's a, a good friend of mine. And if you're not familiar with Edgar. Uh, you should be, and you've probably seen his films, uh, Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Uh, he's an amazing guy, uh, currently uh, finishing up a movie called Baby Driver. And what I've gleaned is it's, a, it's about a uh, getaway driver for, for bank heists. Not sure, he's kind of cagey about it. Uh, but Edgar and I have similar interests, uh, robberies, uh, criminals, deception, all fun things. And, and last year, he invited me over to his house to discuss uh, deceiving people. And because I'm a magician, I'm like, yeah, let's do this. So uh, I went over to his house. I, I brought my friend Blake Voigt, who's one of the best magicians in the world. He's the, probably the cleverest engineer of, of magic tricks and illusions out there today. Uh, and if you just watch America's Got Talent, you saw Blake get all the way to the semifinals. He's amazing. Uh, and Blake and I went over to Edgar's house. And uh, the afternoon did not get off to a great start. We couldn't find the house. We, uh, we apologized. We showed up about 15 minutes late. Uh, but of course, we started doing magic tricks, and everybody was happy. Uh, when we finished, Edgar asked us to do one last trick. And, and we said, uh, we just did all our coolest stuff. But um, yeah, we could probably figure out one more trick to do. Uh, do you have an outdoor space, like a driveway? Is there a driveway we can go into? We'll try this one last thing. And he said, well, I have a backyard. That's nicer. Should we go to the backyard? We agreed to that. And we went out through the kitchen to the backyard. And there we stood on the patio overlooking uh, a, a beautiful, uh, there, there was grass and, and rows of hedges all around us. And I turned to Edgar and I said, I want you to name any playing card. Free choice. Absolute free choice. And he said, OK, five of hearts. And then Blake had uh, Edgar point anywhere he wanted in his backyard. And he pointed at about 2 o'clock from where we were standing at this uh, row of bushes. And we headed over to that hedgerow. And we had him get down on his knees and dig in the mulch at the base of the bushes, right where he pointed. And there was a playing card, and it was the five of hearts. So of course, uh, Edgar lost his shit. Uh, <laughs> and uh, mind blown. And he, and he turned to us and he said, how did you do that? And I said, well, normally I keep uh, the secrets like this uh, from the audience. But because you asked me to, to come over here and teach you how a magician thinks, uh, I'm going to tell you. And I pulled out my iPad and I played him a video. And I'm going to show you a few seconds of it now. And this is. Uh, me and Blake burying 50 playing cards. All right, David Carr here. Uh, we have Blake Boyd there in the background. He's burying playing cards. We're here at Edgar Wright's house an hour before the meeting <laughs> to set up for something really cool. Uh, we're meeting with a cast member. We're going to describe exactly how a con man thinks. Uh, we're going to go bury some cards. Three of clubs. OK. So. <laughs> 52 playing cards in Edgar's backyard before the meeting. Um, 
This is how magic works, by the way. It's, uh, it's, it's, that's the secret. It's not, uh, it's not bunny rabbits and scantily clad women dancing around. Uh, it is forethought, it's anticipation, it's preparation, and, in, uh, and it's planning. And addition, this is kind of why another way that I find puzzling and magic to be the same thing. Uh, in, additional, in addition to being a performer, I, I construct a lot of crosswords to the New York Times. And for me, a magic trick is a puzzle. It's uh, an alignment of misdirection and cleverly engineered ruses. So this morning, I'm going to let you in on one of these principles. Uh, it's called the illusion of free choice. And before you call the magic police on me, uh, this is just the principle only. This is not a technical secret. I'm not going to ruin anyone's magic show. Uh, the illusion of free choice is such that if you are able to get your audience to believe that they are dictating how a trick goes, they will buy into the illusion more. Blake and I did not invent this. It's all around us. Think about this. Uh, perhaps you were at work. You had a great idea for a project. And then you convinced your boss that it was her idea to begin with. Or maybe your client believes it's his idea to buy a product or a program you're offering. He's going to be much more receptive if you don't strong arm him through a hard sell. The upshot, the upshot is that he will take ownership over the idea that best serves your interests. So let's talk about the science behind this. There's a study that I, I think is really cool. It was in 2000. A couple of uh, French scientists, uh, Nicolas Guéguin and Alexandre Pasquel, conducted an experiment in which they sent a, a gentleman into a shopping mall uh, to prove just how powerful the mere suggestion of choice can be. So this man approached two groups of people. Uh, with, uh, with the following appeal. He said, excuse me, could I ask for some change for the bus, please? Just 10% of the people that heard this appeal gave uh, the young man money. But then to a second group, he had the exact same appeal, but he added the following. But you are free to accept or refuse. And this simple acknowledgement of their free choice increased his success rate by 47.5%. Percent, a nearly five. I'm sorry, up to 47.5 percent, a nearly five-fold increase. So, in other words, when people are told they're free, they become more cooperative, more obliging, and more generous. And this is the power of choice. And this is something that magicians take advantage of all the time. Uh, let me take this a step further. We are susceptible to the choice support bias, which means that we feel more ownership and more excitement over the ideas that we arrive at at our own, or ideas that we think we've arrived at at our own. Uh, and I'm going to give you a very cool example from history. It's uh, April 30th, 1943, World War II to be exact. And a local fisherman off the coast of Spain finds a body floating in the Atlantic, face down, in full military khakis, uh, held afloat by a, a, life, uh, a life jacket and with a briefcase chained to his wrist. The contents of his wallet identify him as Major William Martin of the Royal British Marines. And a postmortem concludes that the man fell into the sea while still alive uh, and f had been floating in the Atlantic for about three to five days. Here's the thing Major William Martin is an illusion. He's a fictional character that was conjured up by a hush-hush team, uh, a member of the British Wartime uh, Secret Service Section 17M or 17M, as part of a disinformation mission called Operation Mincemeat. That is what it's called. I'm not sure why. Maybe historians could probably tell me why they came up with that. Um, but that's what it's called. It was a critical mission, Operation Mincemeat. Um, the briefcase contained false information that the Allies were planning to invade Greece and Sardinia in 1943. So the Allies knew that Spain, that was a neutral country, they knew that they, they hoped that their military, which was largely sympathetic to Hitler, uh, would very carefully and secretly open this briefcase, look at this disinformation, and that that information would wend its way uh, to Berlin. The German high command had long suspected that the US would invade 
from North Africa uh, across the Mediterranean, but they didn't know whether it would be Greece or Sardinia or Sicily or the Balkans. Uh, the information suggested Greece and Sardinia, and that's where the Germans chose to fortify their defenses, which left the Allies free to land with minimal opposition in Sicily on July 10, 1943. And that's exactly what happened. Because the Germans found the briefcase themselves, they bought into the illusion more. But back to the present, uh, some, some more thoughts on the, the theory of choice. Um, there's a great book called Nudge by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. Uh, and they, they, they coined the term choice architect. And magicians are great choice architects. These are people who design ways to, to make choices. Um, I'm sorry, we, we, we help people make choices that they themselves think are better. And I, I, there's a great quote by Dwight D. Eisenhower that's, that's relevant to this, which is, leadership is the art of getting people to want what must be done. Magicians are experts at this. We reorganize the context in which audience members make decisions. And I'll, I'll illustrate this very quickly with a, with a simple card trick. I'm not actually going to do the card trick. We'll get to that at the end of this. Um, but uh, you know, I'll, I could have someone pick a card, any card. Uh, I'll shuffle it in the pack. This is sort of standard, standard fare. But then for the, for the end of the trick, for the reveal, uh, uh, or, or the prestige, as they, as they call it in the movies, um, as uh, Jonah Nolan and Chris Nolan did in The Prestige. By the way, I saw um, Westworld last night, and it's like, <laughs> um, it's amazing. But let's say, that I've, uh, let's say that I've found your card in the pack, and it happens to be uh, the, the, the Jack of Diamonds, and I finish the trick this way, and you're sitting right here. So you, the audience, you're sitting right here. And I would say, I'd like you, I know where the Jack of Diamonds is, as the magician, and I'd like you to touch any playing card. Free choice. 75% of the time, roughly, you end up choosing the Jack of Diamonds right here. And the reason is, is because the card that's closest to you is too obvious of a choice. And I've positioned the third and fourth cards far enough away from where you are sitting that you would have to kind of stretch and get out of your chair to touch them. And I think that's a, a nice, simple example from a, from a card trick I learned when I was seven years old of how we alter the, your, your, the, the context in which you make free choices. Uh, I want to go back to the, uh, the choice support bias. This means that we, when we've made a decision, we, we own it. We defend it, whether it's right or wrong. Uh, even if it's proven to be a mistake. And we play up the positive aspects of it and we minimize the, um, the negative consequences or ignore them altogether. And in, fact, in effect, we treat our choices as extensions of ourselves. And choice architects know this. And one of the, the most interesting choice architects that I had a chance to talk to as I was writing this book was a, um, a former hostage negotiator for the FBI. Gary Nessner, who spent 23 years in that position. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Gary because um, I find what he did so fascinating and the way that he was able to use choice in his favor. He first came on the scene in 1993 during the siege at the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas. At the time, just to remind you, David Koresh had hunkered down with a cache of illegal weapons and uh, more than 100 followers, uh, including several dozen children, were trapped with him in the compound. So the FBI came in to try to negotiate, and Nessner's first order of business was to, to free the children. He, he kept reminding Koresh that at the outset of this whole ordeal, he had, um, he had believed that his people were free to go if they wanted to. So Nessner was reminding David Crush of his, of his free choice to let his followers leave if that's something they wanted to do. Because Nessner had literally written the handbook on how to train negotiators to actively listen and exhibit sympathy and attempt to understand the individual on the other side of the situation. 
So in Waco, he put these tactics to the test, and they ended up uh, releasing 35 hostages, hostages, including 19 children. But we kind of know how this ended. The, uh, the, the technical team got restless. They did not uh, acknowledge the incremental progress that the negotiation team was making, and they went in with their guns blazing. It was an absolute debacle. And uh, millions of people watched the compound go up in flames. Only nine Davidians staggered out of the fire. 75 bodies were found in the ashes, including David Koresh's. This was the dawn. They kind of learned from their mistakes, a huge mistake. This is the dawn of the negotiation unit for the FBI. They decided to formally create the crisis negotiation unit. And Gary Nessner would spend the next 10 years until he retired as, his ch as its chief. Now, I caught up with him recently to, to talk to him about this, and this is what he had to say. He said, make decisions with your opponent. <laughs> Ultimatums don't work. Questions often do. Uh, for instance, if a hostage taker is hungry, the negotiator might involve him in his own solution by asking, what are your thoughts on how to get some food to you? And if he happens to say something agreeable, then it's his idea. But if he says something unacceptable, then you will rephrase and reframe and say, let's see if we can come up with some ideas. Let's, let's work together to figure out how we can make this happen. In his book, Stalling for Time, My, Le My Life as an FBI Hostage Negotiator, Nestor explains, to quote him, people want to be shown respect. They want to be understood. The positive relationship achieved through this interaction sets the stage for the negotiator to exert a positive influence over others' behavior, steering them away from violence. And this is choice architecture in action. Now, I know all of you aren't usually involved in, in hostage negotiation situations, but I do think that you can use these ideas, a choice architecture and the power of choice to your benefit to empower you uh, if you have a plan, you have a project, you have a goal that you are trying to get across, you have designed this. You are the, you are the leader that has the architecture. And you can nudge them, which is just ever so slightly, push them in the direction to get them to go where you want them to go. And everybody wins in this situation. And, and one big question, and this is something I've had to, to wrestle with as I write this book, isn't magic inherently deceptive? Well, yes, you could argue that. But I've tried to find all the ways that everybody wins, that magic is a positive thing where the illusion is used to foster better command in, and control in a given situation and ultimately leads to, to more success. I'm going to quickly go back to, uh, to Edgar Wright's backyard and how Blake Voigt and I we're able to buttress our illusion using the, uh, the notion of free choice. And uh, just a little subset of the illusion of free choice is, is something I like to call planned spontaneity. And you've kind of, you, can probably, you, can, you can probably figure out what that means. It's planning to seem unprepared. Uh, and you can see that through all of these examples that I've already given. And this is something that Blake and I did to a great, a great extent. Obviously, we buried 52 playing cards. Uh, but there were other more subtle ways that we were able to bolster this illusion. We, uh, we showed up to the house 15 minutes late, claiming that we couldn't find the house because we had never been there before. <laughs> and that was important, because we had just spent an hour burying all those cards <laughs> in Edgar's backyard. We then waited for Edgar to ask us to do one final trick. We did not offer to do a climactic trick at the end. We waited for him. It was Edgar's idea, to which we responded, uh, we just kind of did all our best stuff. Uh, I don't think we have anything left. But we could probably put something together. And then we did not offer the backyard as the location for this trick. We offered the driveway. The stark and dirty driveway. And, and we allowed Edgar to upgrade us to his beautiful backyard, his choice. Now, if he had agreed to the driveway, we would have figured out a way to say, you know what, Let's, this, is, this isn't quite working. Can we go to the back? And that's sort of a big, big part of magic, is that he doesn't know what the end of the story is. We hold that 
we, we can sort of pivot and iterate to get where we want to go because we haven't set up the expectation of what the end of the story is. Now you're probably wondering, how is it that once Edgar named the Five of Hearts, we were able to get him to point directly at the card that he chose? And I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I have to keep some things a secret. But I will say that we used a lot of uh, suggestion and influence to get him to point right where we wanted him to point. But I will say this. Around that little ruse, we then um, we changed the, the story. And uh, every time I see Edgar, and, and even, so let me say this, directly after he chose that, as, we're, as he's kind of flabbergasted, his mind is blown, we're reminding him right then and there, Edgar, you could have pointed anywhere you wanted. And every time I see him at like a cocktail party, I say, hey, remember when you could have like, you could have pointed anywhere you wanted and you just happened to point at the five of hearts. It was amazing. Uh, so that's a big thing is that magicians are, can, can manipulate your memory of what has taken place uh, during the trick. I hope you enjoyed your coffee and your cactus water and, uh, and, your, and you should be energized for the day. I hope you learned something about the science of illusion and that you might in a, in a very small way be able to apply that to your life. Uh, and I'm David Kwong and thank you for coming out. I appreciate it. Thanks.